Next, Frank and Mary in Framingham with your hosts, Grace O'Donnell and me, Art Bergeron. Today's guest is doctor is cardiologist, Dr. Connie Zhao. Uh, she joins us today to talk about heart disease, heart disease prevention, and heart disease treatment. Stay tuned. this episode of Frank and Mary in Framingham. I'm Grace O'Donnell, Director of Elder Services at the Callahan Center. And I'm Art Bergeron. My day job is as an elder law attorney working at uh, Myrick O'Connell, um, the largest law firm outside of Boston. My office is around in, in Westboro. But this, really, this show really is not about um, elder law. It's about my friends, Frank and Mary. Frank and Mary if you've ever been to one of my presentations, Frank and Mary have a very simple goal. They want to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if that's in Framingham, they want to be right here. So this show is about who the people are and what the programs are that Frank and Mary need to know about if they want to just continue to live their lives right here in Framingham. So our guest today, Arthur, is Dr. Connie Zhao. She's both an MD and an MPH. She's a cardiologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and is an investigator with the Framingham Heart Study. Thank you for welcoming me here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, Connie, one of the things that I often hear from people is, are there certain foods I can eat or certain exercises I can do to keep my heart healthy? That is a very good question. And uh, those are both very, very important lifestyle metrics that we consider both in the clinic and in the research forum. And I think it's really important for the elder citizens of Framingham and other communities to know. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, to tackle food first, I think people probably are aware, but we do recommend also, we do try to strive for people to, to do in their daily diet is really to emphasize the more Mediterranean type of style of diet, which I'm sure that you have heard about um, to maybe make it more clear for everybody in case there's any question. The real emphasis there is on healthy fruits, vegetables, and whole grains and, and a minority of red meat. So very little red meat uh, and a little bit of dairy is okay too. So I can go into that in a little bit more detail, but I think that for food and avoiding things like saturated fats, which are in red meat, uh, a lot of cholesterol products and sugary beverages, sugary foods, um, pastries and other baked goods that tend to be high in Carbohyd simple carbohydrates that are the things that we would like to avoid. Those are some of the, the, the key points that we, I would say for, as a cardiologist that I advise for, for food choices. Um, that would also include avoiding sugar sweetened beverages, which is a very common source of simple carbohydrates. And for exercise, now that's also a, that's a huge area of, of uh, research within Framingham as, as well as diet, actually. Um, and I can speak more to, there's a huge amount of investigators who are, and trainees who are working on this, thanks to the generosity of all the Framingham participants. Um, but, but basically for exercise, we know that um, doing a little is better than not doing any at all. Um, for anybody who feels sedentary, it's not too late to just pick up and start walking, for example, or just doing some things around the home or even better than just sitting still, for example. So even little things can help. You don't have to start doing marathons, um, although we do know that aerobic exercise is very good for the heart and for longevity in general, as well as for the brain. Um, and that's another large area that we're interested in, in, in within Framingham and, and uh, other studies that a lot of places uh, have shown, including Framingham, that exercise and eating right 
are not just good for your physical well-being, but also for your mental well-being and, and your cognition. So how well you can maintain healthy aging for a long time. Yeah, I, I keep reading more and more about that, that uh, recommendation to avoid coming down with dementia or Alzheimer's, that we really should be moving more frequently. Uh, even people like me who sit at a computer all day, uh, recommending that we get up every hour and maybe walk around the building or something like that so that yeah. we're just not sitting that whole time. Right, absolutely. I think even for for people who work and sit at the desk uh, or people who sit in front of their TV or sit reading a book, um, you know, all of the routine activities that we might do um, in the cold weather, particularly, maybe, it's important to remember to keep moving at some level. And even standing um, is better than sitting. Um, you use more metabolic activity and it's uh, healthier also maybe for your back, but but also healthier metabolically. And, and so we do encourage people to just keep that in mind. Anybody who has kind of a, a smartwatch or a smartphone ha can have these programmed in. Some of these actually come routinely programmed in to remind people to be more physically active. Yeah, I have I've have found those to be a good reminder for me. Sometimes I'll take a look at it at the end of the day and I'll see I'm, I'm 0.8 of a mile and I'll say, oh, come on, I can walk around the house and, and get it up to, to a full mile or a full two miles or whatever. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have different metrics for measuring physical activity from low to more intense, uh, but studies have shown that even low levels Moderate is maybe even better than low, but even low better levels are better than being completely sedentary and being sedentary for long periods of time, you know, so, so even small, small bursts of activity when possible uh, is good. Now, I think um, given the weather also, it brought to mind something that I, I think I should bring up, um, which is when it snows, you know, when people might be inclined to, to especially people who previously have shoveled their driveways all these years um, and their walkways. Oh, it's just, if I just do a little bit, you know, I, I'll just get out there and just do a little bit. I don't feel like hiring somebody or you know, things like that. Um, that's generally not really advised for people in their older years, especially people who have remained sedentary or, or are traditionally sedentary for a long period of time. So these sudden bursts of intense lifting or uh, activities, which is almost like weightlifting, um, it's different than aerobic activity, which is more walking or biking or running, those kinds of things. So, so lifting large loads, uh, as with shoveling, uh, puts not only strain on your muscles, but it also changes the pressures inside your thoracic cavity and increases your blood pressure such that this can precipitate things like extreme uh, elevations in your blood pressure and, and heart attacks. Wow. So this may or may not be known, but uh, often people don't really heed the advice and um, looking outside, like today, for example, I think, um, and with the rest of the winter and the winters to come, just try to keep that in mind is what I would say as well. So regular activity is good, but um, picking it up when you decide to, to do some heavy sh snow shoveling, especially wet, heavy snow is just not advisable. Um, and, and it's good, really good hard to, to give that advice when it's a snow day and you're outside as I was this morning and wanted to, you know, and you're running behind and you're like, I got to get out of here, right? But to say to yourself, but what's the price? But what's right. the price, right? I mean, right. I, had a, I had a client last year, early in the year where there was, an, not last, two years ago, early in the year where there was an early snowstorm and he died. He, you know, he was on his, right? And he was just shoveling. Yeah. And, just, and, and you know, fell down and and nobody was there around. He, he just died. So it's, yeah. it's, it can be very sensitive. Now, may I ask one question though, related to what you were saying? When you say every little, you know, a little is better than a lot. Is there a, is there a, a limit to how small a little is? I mean, I mean I'm think, when I'm, I'm thinking, when you, when you think you really want to get out and just like take, like take a short walk, but is there a, when you say short, is there a, an amount that you say that's, that's a reasonable amount that's going to kind of get you, that's really going to help you versus other things? 
Right. Well, that's that's a very good activity, a uh, very good question. We don't actually know what level of activity constitutes the the least of you know what the least level of activity is that may constitute some benefit for cardiovascular protection. That's what I want to say. So so we do know that people when they're studied who just do short walks around the block actually do better than people who have much more sedentary time and who don't report such activity. But we don't really know in terms of, you know, number of steps, what is the minimum amount? amount. So someone is really lazy, but they really want to just get in some amount of benefit. I think it, as far as I think we have evidence for, there is a continuous relationship between physical activity and decrease in cardiovascular events so that the more you do, typically the better, up to a certain point. You know, if you do regular marathons, there's some question of whether actually that's very good for you or whether you hit a limit and you start to maybe experience some damage. So, so certain elite level of activity, that's probably not pertaining to this audience uh, or maybe this audience previously or made. I hope I don't offend anybody who truly is an elite athlete out there. Uh, I'm not one of them. Um, but, but certainly regular activity, even just trying to get up a few steps to maybe 5,000 steps as a, as a goal or two, 2000 steps as a initial goal might be something that's worth, worth doing. So so 10,000 is something we try to strive for, but I'm not sure that everybody can really, really achieve that who hasn't been regularly doing it. But starting slow and building up is something we can do. I, I think it's tricky in the winter months. Um, I think in in the winter months, there's ice and we have to be careful of just the physical aspects of slipping and falling and you know, the price that one might pay for, for that and the balance you have to take between taking risks outside to try to increase your cardiovascular health, but also, but then ending up with a broken bone. So, um, so I think if there is, are opportunities to walk within the house, even uh, on very cold days, that's that's good. Or if there's play, there's parks that have flat ground that are well shoveled out, that are are safe, then that that's also good. But I, I have seen other people in their apartment buildings um, taking walks, you know, with masks on in their apartment buildings, even up and down the hall, maybe up and down a couple flights of stairs in their apartment buildings is is also great, but better than sitting at home. Can, can I ask Dr. Tso, mm-hmm. for somebody who has not been active, is it important that they see their doctor before taking on some sort of exercise regimen? Yeah, that's a very good question as well. So we do advise, particularly after somebody has had any sort of cardiac event, for example, even a minor heart attack, we do advise that those individuals undergo a monitored cardiac rehabilitation program. And usually those people have been already informed that they should be really supervised before they take on anything else. If you're just a plain sedentary individual and now wants to pick up some activity, great for you. Um, But you don't necessarily need to see your doctor to get clearance before, say, deciding to walk a couple blocks. But, you know, common sense, uh, you probably don't want to just start putting on your running shoes and trying to go jogging. You probably want to take it slowly and keep in mind of your symptoms. So symptoms uh, that brings up a whole other topic, but, you know, symptoms are very varied for, for the heart disease. You know, people talk about the classic symptoms of chest pain, squeezing, something like an elephant sitting on your chest, going down your left arm, sometimes up to your neck. We see that in, you know, modest to minority percent of cases. Many, many people are just vague symptoms of nausea, feeling very, very fatigued, feeling like something's just not right in their chest or some sort of ill sensation um, in their chest. And it's a very vague sensation. Those people sometimes wait it out at home, particularly with COVID and and uh, sometimes don't know. Those could be warning signs as well. So I think for it's important for people to know to keep those in, symptoms in mind. If things just don't feel quite right, then don't push it further. Yeah. And always, it's a good idea to check up with your with your doctor. I think most cardiac patients do have their regular checkups, but for others who don't have a 
a doctor or or don't check in regularly with the doctor, then it's probably a good thing to do once every every year at least, just to make sure the blood pressure's in check, you're eating right, you're doing the right, you know, doing the right things, you're taking the right medications and and any adjustments that need to be made. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, you mentioned earlier about people limiting their intake of red meat. When you say limit, would that be like one serving a week, one serving a month? Is there a specific recommendation on that? That's a, that's a great question. I think, you know, the phrase everything in moderation. So it depends, I think, on your preference. So your preference for balancing what you want to enjoy out of life and what you, you know, what your ultimate goals are. So for short-term goals, you know, everyone wants to, I mean, every, I think in long-term goals, everyone would want to say, I want to live as healthy as possible for as long as possible while being you know, as functional and cognitively intact as possible, right? Nobody, nobody wants to be a vegetable for a long period of time. Nobody wants to live for a very short period of time either presuming we all enjoy our, our lives and our get quality from our friends and family. So, so, you know, day to day, you do want to enjoy what you're eating. Food is a source of joy and pleasure. Um, but if you don't value red meat that much and you don't feel bad about cutting it out, it is healthier not to eat it because you can get protein, a much healthier protein, actually environmentally more sustainable protein from plant based diets rather than meat, uh, particularly red meat based diets. So, you know, some people have taken that plunge and converted to vegetarianism or vegan um, diets. And those are probably more healthy based upon what is known and research is known. Um, however, a lot of people are used to eating red meat and love red meat and cannot imagine their lives without it, then it'd probably be torture to ask them to cut it out of their lives completely. Mm -hmm. So for those people, probably, you know, a, a good balance might be something like once a week or once every other week, but those are, that would be for people who truly, truly value it. For me, I have to say I I could live without it, and uh, and for that reason, I don't try to seek it out because it's just not as healthy. Um, but for people who derive enough intense pleasure from it, then I think they can they can allow themselves a little bit once once in a while, you know. Uh -huh. um, and just to, also, I would say watch. I mentioned sugar sugary beverages and cholesterol, but one thing I may not have mentioned is sodium intake. And that's something that I think sometimes when people either live alone or it's just easier, um, they might buy prepackaged foods or frozen foods. And those, those contain a lot, tend to contain a lot of more unhealthy ingredients, such as more saturated fat and more sodium um, as well. So for people who buy uh, or order in uh, from takeout, for example, it's important to keep those nutritional facts in mind. If, if possible, check nutrition labels before buying them and that kind of thing. Yeah, great, great. And are, I'm sorry, Arthur, could I just ask, are there any new treatments out there for people who do have heart disease? Oh, well, that's a, that's a huge, we could have many more talks about that. Okay. There, are, there are many, many new emerging treatments for, for heart disease and many aspects of heart disease, which is wonderful. So uh, heart disease treatments, including in particular heart failure and treatment for, for uh, coronary artery disease, medical treatments as well as interventional or like surgical treatments have majorly advanced in the past decade or mm -hmm. even more. Um, and many of much of that knowledge has been from community studies such as Framingham, as well as other trials that have been done in other individuals throughout the country and throughout other international sites. Uh, but, but certainly there are many, many, and, and for those, I think people do need to consult with their doctor about what is right for them, um, it, what side effects there might be, what other, uh, what other lifestyle choices that might need to be altered based upon those. But I think the encouraging news is that if you are somebody who does have cardiovascular disease, there are so many new treatments now and so many new that are also up and coming that prolong quality of life as well as longevity. So it itself. So I think that's, that's very, very encouraging. Yeah. Great to know. 
I was going to say one of the one of the things that I always talk to clients about is the fact that it, it, it in terms of those diseases, it's so different now from when we were growing up, you know, when I was growing up. And I, and I remember, you know, you would just hear someone had a heart attack while they died, you know, or someone had a stroke and they died. And I remember seeing the statistic that in like 1970, if you had a stroke or a heart attack, your likelihood of living for uh, or dying within the next 14 days was like 33%. And that as of about four or five years ago, your chances of dying in 14 days were like 3%. It, it's an incredible, an incredible change, you know, and, and, and for so many, you know, for so many folks that if that fear is that something suddenly is just going to grab you, that's always been heart attack or, or stroke, that that fear has really been reduced as a result of all this. It's been really special. Really yeah, special. absolutely. Absolutely. Medicine has advanced in so many ways over the past several decades and recently quite a lot for, for, the, for heart disease. So I, I think that's good. It doesn't mean that people should feel at liberty to uh, ruin their health by making poor lifestyle choices. Uh, I think that that the lifestyle, poor lifestyle choices may be mitigated a little bit by some of the new medications that are out, but it's always best to try to prevent when possible, you know, the onset of disease. And, you know, some of it is genetics. So that's also been studied well in Framingham um, uh, in particular. Um, and that is something that we can't so far do too much about. Mm -hmm. um, so I always tell patients like you're look, you're born with the genes that you're born with and the heritability for whatever disease is, is in with your, your family. Everybody tends, things run, disease, certain diseases run in every family and you have what you were born with. Um, we may in the future be able to do some gene editing and other modulation to kind of change some of that risk, but you, you can, the only things that you really have control over at this point are your lifestyle choices. And so I think that's why I really like to emphasize for people who don't have any heart disease or even people who do the best lifestyle choices you can make are, are really important for your well being. Okay. And does uh, limiting smoking and alcohol also are those still recommendations for people to have healthier hearts? Absolutely for smoke, for cigarette smoking. Yes. And now there's e-cigarettes and other, other types of substances. Those we, we do, they, they're not recommended that people in, engage in. They, they certainly, e-cigarettes don't have the same lung effects, but they still raise the blood pressure and have the same effects that nicotine has, which are adverse effects to the human body. Um, alcohol in moderation, which is one glass a day, uh, of, of wine or one small uh, ounce of hard liquor could be okay. So we, there, there's been a lot of literature on the benefits of, of wine, um, even beer. So, so one beer, I mean, one drink a day is fully allowable and sometimes encouraged. More than that, uh, particularly for small people, uh, small habitus people like small in stature, is not advised. I mean, so it's one of those, it could be a double-edged sword. It can be very good for you, has uh, some antioxidants and other benefits, but too much can also damage other or other organs, including the liver and other, other aspects. It can cause heart disease and heart failure. So it, in moderation, it can be okay, and, and, but not, not, not more than that. So instead of having two glasses of wine, have one glass of wine and a bunch of grapes. A bunch of grapes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So more, more fruits and just getting rid of, I think a, a very easy choice is just to get rid of white bread and white pasta and those kinds of simple carbohydrates that people are used to the taste of white crackers, white breads and et cetera. But it's, it's a simple substitute to just substitute in whole grain. It doesn't cost a lot more and it's, you, the taste is a little different, but it's sort of like uh, just s switching anything. Um, I think you don't have to go cold turkey and suddenly cut out all your meats and all your dairy and ice cream and switch from pasta, white pasta to wheat, everything. You can do things in small steps. And I think 
that is making small steps in, whether it be with exercise or with your diet are, are both lifestyle choices that anybody can do. It's very easy to do. You just have to have some motivation to do it. And taking small steps is, is the first, is the first uh, method to preserving cardiovascular health and, and um, your well-being. Terrific. Can I ask one, one quick question? The classic wine question. So I'm a white wine drinker. Whenever I hear Mediterranean diet, I think of red wine. Do I really have to switch to red wine? <laughs> That's a very good question. Well, How? you don't, ha again, it's a, you know, a red wine. Has, don't tell me. Have white, more white wine in moderation. No, don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, both, both are, are fun in terms of, you know, the alcohol itself. I think both are similar. Red wine has some more antioxidants and that's, that's why I think a lot of people have that has received more attention for it being healthier than other forms of alcohol. But, but go ahead. And if you really don't like red wine, don't, don't force yourself to suddenly switch uh, that that's fine. But I would say, you know, for people who love their ice cream and they love their, thing things with saturated fat i would more strongly encourage cutting out that habit or at least really limiting that to to the the bare minimum that would make you happy right right dr Tsao, thank you so much this has been really educational for us and hopefully for our audience as well we really appreciate your time today it's, it's been it's been just terrific, and I have to admit it's so wonderful to be talking about something but COVID. So I think this is a really important topic for a lot of people. It's just been really fascinating. So thank you, and and, and thank you, Grace. Grace consistently finds these great people um, for this show, and I think it's been helpful for a lot of the Frank and Marys in this world who just want to be living here and living well. So thank you very much, uh, You're and and thank you, folks, for uh, watching this show. I hope you've enjoyed it. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Framingham. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and best wishes to everybody who's listening. <laughs>